Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the invitation. Um, so as Stanford students would always like to point out, Stanford is not located at Palo Alto. So uh, let me first correct the title. Um, yes, oh, so now this might be better. And um, so today I'm going to talk about combinatorial structures in big data and their role in making informed decisions when faced with a massive pool of possibilities. So in fact, many scientific and engineering models feature inherently discrete decision variables, such as which set of medical experiments to run in order to have a correct diagnosis, or which brain regions corresponds, uh, correspond to a particular stimuli. And similarly, nearly all aspects of machine learning pipeline involve discrete tasks from data summarization and crowd teaching, where we would like to find representative data points to large scale inference and model interpretation. So in, all, in, in almost all of these problems, we are often encountered by a variant of a subset selection problem, where we have a collection of choices from which we would like to select a set that maximizes some sort of utility. For instance, in product recommendation, we aim to propose a set of goods that satisfies a user. In experimental design problem, we wish to run the most informative subset of experiments to reach a conclusion. And in many variants of data summarization, the aim is to select the most representative subset, subset of data points from a massive data set. So in all these examples, we have a ground set V of items, tests, and data points, and a utility function F that specifies how satisfied the users are, how informative the tests are, or how representative the data points are. And the goal is usually to maximize uh, the utility while satisfying some natural constraints, you know, such as a size constraint, like how many items at most we may propose to a user or an knapsack constraint, like how much budget we are willing to spend on a set of experiments. Of course, without any structure, solving such optimization problems are notoriously hard. Yeah. However, the problems of practical interest, such as the ones that I showed in the beginning, are often much more well-behaved and have extra structures that allow them to be tractable. So let's first see what are the important ingredients of a useful structure. First, it should be uh, you know, a non-trivial structure so that it can be stated in general and encapsulates many applications. Second, it should be preserved under many operations and transformations so that we have a calculus. And finally, it should be a structure that is amenable to optimization, either exactly or approximately, so that it leads to a useful theory. In the continuous optimization domain, this structure is usually referred to as convexity. Its counterpart in the discrete domain is called submodularity. OK, so let me explain submodularity using a historical epidemic that took place in London in the 19th century. John Snow, uh, not the true king of the North, but uh, one of the founders of epidemiology was aiming to trace the source of the cholera outbreak in Soho, London. And for that reason, he had to perform tests in different locations, such as S1 and S2 in the figure. And each test would identify the quality of water in a small area that are shown in pink. And clearly, in order to you know, gather more information, Snow had to perform more tests in new locations, such as S3 and S4. But at the same time, we should realize that the added value of each test, meaning the added area covered by each new test, decreases. And to see this, let's consider a new test at the new location S. Uh, so on the left, the area covered by S is shown in red, whereas on the right by green. And uh, well, clearly, the, you know, the red shape contains a green shape. So submodularity formalizes this diminishing returns property. For any set A and its superset B and any new element S, the marginal gain of adding S to A uh, uh, is larger than adding it to B. Also note that some modularity is different from, from monotonicity, which states that adding elements can only increase the utility. Uh, so in fact, some modular functions can be monotone or non-monotone. And this was a relevant observation in the 19th century. It is still a central idea in our COVID app that we developed at Yale for efficient outbreak detection. To gain a little bit of intuition, let's go through a few examples. Um, it is known that the spread of influence or information over a social network under many stochastic diffusion models is submodular. Many notions of information are submodular. For instance, the information we gain by collecting noisy observations about a set of random variables is submodular. 
uh, many notions of diversity of submodular. For instance, um, um, you know, in a determinant of point process, the probability of observing a set of vectors indexed by S is proportional to the volume spanned by these uh, vectors squared. And uh, because you know, the volume is related to the determinant, um, the log determinant objective function that maximizes this probability is submodular. And finally, many uh, cost functions uh, in economics are submodular. So the economy of scales states that adding an item to a smaller bundle of items costs less than adding it to a larger bundle. So like many fundamental notions in mathematics, submodularity is a concept that has been rediscovered over and over in different fields with a long history in operations research, information theory through the very notion of entropy and capacity, statistical physics through the IZ models, game theory through the combinatorial uh, auctions, and recently many applications of machine learning. So if you're, um, you know, if you're interested in the application of submodularity, you can check out a recent survey in IEEE Signal Processing Magazine. Now, in order to solve the following optimization problem, classically we assume that the function f can be evaluated exactly on any set s of the ground set v. So for a simple example, the value of any set might be equal to the square root of its size. Or when we have a collection of subsets, the value of any subcollection uh, equals to the size of their union, okay? And to compare algorithms, we have two main criteria, uh, approximation guarantee, which means what fraction of the optimum value we obtain, and the query complexity, which means how many times we evaluate the function f. So let me start with the most celebrated result in submodular maximization. Here, we have a monotone submodular function, and we would like to find a set of size at most k that maximizes f. To solve this problem, Nimhauser and company proposed a greedy algorithm that starts at an empty set and at each iteration finds an element that maximizes the marginal gain. Um, they showed that the solution provided by the greedy algorithm with n times k function evaluations achieves a tight 1 minus 1 over approximation guarantee. In other words, this is the best solution we can achieve in polynomial time. How about the query complexity or you know, how fast we can achieve such a, uh, such a good solution? Well, after 40 plus years, we recently settled this question too. Uh, so uh, in fact, we showed that there, there is a deterministic algorithm with a linear query complexity independent of size k that achieves the tight approximation guarantee of one minus one over e. And on the flip side, we provided an information theoretic lower bound stating that any algorithm that aims to achieve a constant approximation guarantee has to make a linear number of queries. So given you know, the progress we have made so far, we can easily categorize and summarize larger scale data sets. What you see on the top is the performance of the fastest implementation of greedy versus our linear time algorithm. So while both algorithms achieve practically, practically the same utility, our algorithm is orders of magnitude faster than the greedy algorithm for large values of k. And this is a very typical behavior that we, we see across all data sets that we have tested our results. We have also developed the first streaming or on the fly optimization methods that also achieve the tightest approximation guarantee and memory footprint. And in practice, our methods perform more than 300 times faster than the previous heuristics uh, on applications such as you know, video summarization, where the goal is to capture a diverse set of scenes as the video clip uh, is being uh, played. So here I'm showing a, a real life instance where our streaming algorithm along with the neural net that detects indi individual faces are running together. Simultaneously, a kernel is being learned so that an instance of a determinant of point process can be run in the background in order to select a set of diverse scenes and, and by simply look at the selected frames, one can easily identify the important moments of the, of the video clip and uh, hopefully narrate the whole story. Finally, we introduced the first scalable techniques and recently proved that in a constant round, uh, round of distributed computing, uh, we achieved the tight approximation guarantee. And this method enabled us to tackle the largest exemplar based clustering considered in the literature on 80 million images. So, if you do not throw eggs and tomatoes at me, uh, I would say that this is an instance of uh, theory-informed data science. In a sense, we have developed algorithms that achieve the fundamental limits of computations, 
and simultaneously perform orders of magnitude better than the existing heuristics. And it really feels that we are done and I can finish my talk here. Uh, I mean, since you are, since you have a big done slide here, maybe I can ask you a question at this point. So sure. there is a O of subscript epsilon. Yes. The, now, can you say something about the dependency on epsilon? It seems like something it's you try to hide. Oh. No, it's n over epsilon. It's n over epsilon. Yes, that's it. Okay. Okay. Nothing too high. So we're done only if there wasn't one tiny issue. Usually, there is no oracle. So today I'm going to talk about a more realistic and practical situation when such a perfect oracle does not exist. And here is the outline of the talk. So I will first discuss combinatorial optimization in the face of big data. And then I'll talk about why we should go to the continuous domain and find a robust solution there. And then finally, how we can come back to the discrete domain and complete the full, uh, the full circle. Okay. so. Um, in fact, in many machine learning applications, we cannot evaluate the function exactly either because the value has to be estimated and learned from the data uh, as in many data summarization settings, or it is identified, it is um, uh, basically defined by a stochastic process such as uh, you know, influence maximization over a social network. Um, so more concretely, uh, you know, in data summarization, the value of a set is usually defined in terms of uh, the average similarities of all data points to a selected subset of uh, uh, to a selected subset S. And here, when the ground set V is large, say hundreds of millions of data points, computing this function on the left even once is infeasible. Similarly, in influence maximization problem, the objective function is defined as the expectation of a stochastic process quantifying the size of the subset of nodes influenced from a selected seed of nodes S. Of course, here F can only be evaluated approximately through simulations. And unfortunately, all the greedy algorithms that we discussed uh, you know, before fail to provide any guarantees when faced with such uh, stochasticity. So uh, more concretely, uh, so let us consider the following stochastic optimization problem where we would like to find a set S that maximizes the value of the function F. But the function is F is defined as an expected value over F theta. So as before, we, you know, we assume that F is monotone, submodular, but we do not make any assumptions about F theta. The distribution D may or may not be known. In data summarization setting, it was uniform over all data points. In the influence maximization, it, you know, it may not even be known because we don't even know what is a diffusion process. So the lens through which we see F is its stochastic realizations, basically F theta one, F theta two, et cetera. And what we would like to know is whether we can maximize F by seeing only such samples. Heuristically, uh, you know, when we do not know the true objective function, we usually learn a surrogate function from data, right? Such as the empirical man mean estimate, and then run an optimization algorithm such as the greedy or you know its variance on the surrogate function and use the solution of the surrogate as the solution of the true objective function that we aim to optimize. But then what kind of guarantees do we have, right? So in other words, can we actually optimize objective functions from the training data we use to learn them? Um, and, and at a high level, the issue is that um, in the discrete solution space, we need to make discrete moves while coping with noisy function values, which does not provide much room for course correction and backtracking. In contrast, if we could teleport the problem to the continuous domain, we would be able to enjoy the flexibility of making small moves in many directions, you know, check the quality of fractional solutions and pivot the optimization problem towards the robust ones. And this is why uh, you know, we are now uh, start our journey towards novel continuous relaxation of submodular functions. But before going into details, uh, let me show you a small experiment on influence maximization on social networks, the problem that I talked. So the red curve that you see here shows the performance of a continuous method that I'm going to uh, talk about. And the blue dashed line is the performance of the fastest discrete method. 
Um, and in order to reach the same utility, the continuous method is almost 80 times faster. And as we increase the size of the problem, these gaps become even larger. So now let's see how we can go from discrete domain to the continuous domain. And first, uh, let's see how we can define diminishing returns in the continuous domain. Now, remember that in the discrete domain, we had two sets, A and B, where A was a subset of B. In the continuous domain, we have two vectors, X and Y, where X is smaller than Y component-wise. Okay. In the discrete domain, we added a new element E to both sets and considered the marginal gain. Similarly, in the continuous domain, we increased X and Y along the same basis here, say EI, by value alpha and consider the marginal gain. And we see, uh, you know, we say that if a, a continuous function, capital F, is dr submodular, and dr means diminishing returns. If this inequality holds along any basis, EI, and any positive value alpha. And here is a simple example of such functions. An immediate consequence of this definition is that if the function f is differentiable, the gradient is an antitone mapping. In other words, the function f is concave along positive directions. And when, if, when f is twice differentiable, all entries of the Hessian are non-positive. Uh, non and from these properties, it is clear that such functions are not concave nor convex. Uh, in, in general, but you know they have interesting structures. So let's uh, you know go through a few examples of zero submodular functions. Uh, you know the simplest one is an indefinite quadratic program of the form that I'm showing here, where all entries of H are non-positive. Uh, in experimental design problem, in particular in the experimental design, the objective function that we aim to optimize are you know are continuous submodular functions. Uh, currently, the best uh, uh, methods uh, with the best approximation guarantee for finding the map inference of determinantal point processes are either based on soft max extension that I'm showing here, or the multilinear multilinear extension, both of which are DR submodular. Many instance of, uh, instances of revenue maximization on social networks are DR submodular. And finally, multilinear extension extends any set function to a unit cube. And when the set function is submodular, its multilinear extension is the R submodular. And we'll discuss this point later as we want to go back to the uh, discrete domain. Sorry, I mean, a quick question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, so, sure. The, so you wrote this objective function for experimental design. This is because you want to maximize or minimize yeah, yeah. the yeah. volume yeah. of yeah. the confidence yeah. region. Very good, yes. So you are taking kind of a, I don't know. So why, why yeah. is the log, the volume is the right? Oh, so this is this actually comes up in the um, uh, so the optimal design actually comes up in um, when you have a, a linear bandit problem. Right, uh, I understand. One way to actually solve, yeah. So this is you know what you have to maximize. Actually, you have to maximize the determinant. Correct. Uh, the log um, uh, that maximizes the volume, but here you know the log determinant is going to be the continuous one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so these are how you actually uh, um, um, yeah, construct your confidence inf intervals uh, for the uh, right. I mean, you that. might as well decide that you you know look at the maximum confidence interval around any coordinates. I mean, correct, correct. I mean, the volume is, is one, one way. That... I mean, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it no, makes no, sense. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I completely agree. This is one way to do it, and. You know, uh, I just put it as an example. Uh, and if you'd like to maximize it, this is uh, continuous margin. But I fully agree. Thank you. Good. So now, instead of solving the discrete stochastic problem where we don't know what to do, let's consider its continuous counterpart, where capital F is a smooth, monotone, and zero submodular. The distribution is generally unknown, and the constraint domain is a bounded convex body. Again, we see f through its stochastic samples as follows. Uh, we can query the function f at any point x, and the oracle will output a random vector g, which in expectation is the gradient of f at x. So in the optimization language, this oracle is called the stochastic first order oracle. All right. So now let's see how we can solve such a non-convex uh, stochastic problem. Uh, so given a stochastic optimization problem, maybe the simplest algorithm to run is the projected gradient method, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, more specifically, you know, the projected gradient ascent, because you're maximizing, 
right? The, the, the objective function, the utility, it starts at a point inside the feasibility set. And at each iteration, we update our current position xt by making a small step along the direction of the stochastic gradient. And if you go outside of the feasibility set, we project the position back into the set. But because in our case, the function f is non-convex in general, non-convex or non-concave in general, it is not clear at all what the quality of the solution is because it depends on the landscape of the, of the station points. And that might be arbitrarily bad with respect to the optimal solution. Now, when f is monotone and so modular, interestingly, we can prove that the function value at any associated point is at least half optimal. And the factor half here comes from a very simple but very important inequality. Uh, so remember for concave functions, we know that the tangent plane at uh, every point is an upper bound to the, to the function. The so modular functions are not concave, but they're concave along positive directions. And by using this property, we can derive a similar but different inequality for any two points x and y. And the factor half in the guarantee is the result of the additional factor two in this inequality. So uh, more concretely, we show that in order to you know, converge to one half approximation guarantee, we need to run a stochastic gradient ascent for one of our epsilon squared iterations. And on the flip side, there are monotone zero submodular functions, which have a stationary point at exactly half optimal. So if you start a uh, you know, stochastic gradient ascent within the vicinity of such a stationary points, it is going to converge to those. Okay. And so basically, this is the landscape. And uh, you know, the next natural question is whether or not we can go beyond one half approximation guarantee. Uh, and in particular, we should, uh, you know, we should expect naturally that we can achieve one minus one over approximation guarantee, which, you know, above which is, is easy to show that it is hard. Right. I mean, can I, answer, very, can I ask a very sure. dumb clarifying question? So, Shoot. Um, and I think it's because I missed something. So we started off with a little f, which is a submodular function, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe, is it monotone submodular? Yes. For okay. now, yes. Little monotone submodular function. And yeah. now we have done a continuous relaxation to get capital F. Yes, I just talked yeah. about uh, continuous. Are, are these related yes. at all? Is there a what, what's the I have, I have not made, yeah, I have not made the relationships yet. Okay, so, the, You're so going you ahead. have not told us what the translation between little F and big F is. Not yet. Are you going not to? Not yet. Well, I hope so. Okay, uh, yeah, thank you. All right, so I didn't uh, actually miss anything. This is just something. No, no, not yet. Okay. I'm just, I'm just going to talk to you right now. We are just talking about these continuous submodular functions. Okay, sounds good. And how we can, we can maximize them, and then I'm going to relate them. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I was worried I had missed something completely. No, you haven't missed anything. Okay, thank you. Okay. So Very I mean, good. I mean, so yes. the. Uh, what's the name of this class of function again? I'm trying to remember. DR great, DR something. Oh, continuous submodular functions. I continuous submodular function. So continuous submodular. So the assumption here is that f sub theta is uh sub continuous submodular for every theta. Is that the assumption? Yes. Got no. It. So capital F is continuous submodular, which is the expected value of f f of thetas. We don't have to assume anything about about f of thetas. What I need is that f the expectation is continuous submodular. Oh, okay. I see. But I would but imagine course, that but of course, I would imagine yeah, there would be some course. lemma which says that under some condition f sub theta, then the expectation would have be continuous submodular. So if if f of thetas are continuous submodular, f is going to be. Okay. But, but, but there are examples in, there are examples in which f of theta itself is not continuous submodular, but f is. It, you can come up with examples that, you know, and, and that has been done actually, in, even in the, you know, uh, continuous, you can have expected value of non-convex functions, which is convex. The same way you can have expect, you know, expected value of uh, continuous, non-continuous submodular functions that are continuous submodular. Yes, that can be done. So that is why, you know, I'm not going to assume anything about f of thetas, but naturally they are going to be continuous submodular. Okay, got it, thank you. So, um, so can we achieve better than one half? The answer to this question is yes. And to achieve better solutions, we need uh, some new techniques where you know, the optimization trajectory would avoid those stationary points through the course of the uh, algorithm. Okay. 
And this will bring us to conditional gradient methods or Frank Wolf algorithm. So let me first, um, you know, let's first see how such a method, uh, you know, works in the simpler deterministic case where we can compute the exact gradients. Okay. Uh, so at um, any uh, round t, instead of going along the direction of the gradient, we do something slightly more clever. We find within the constraint set k a vector that is mostly aligned with the gradient. So in other words, we find a vector v that has the largest inner product with the gradient. This vector is shown uh, you know, here in the picture in blue. So this is an optimization problem with a linear objective to solve over a constraint set K. And once the vector VT is found, we make a small step along the direction of VT, not the gradient, okay? So note that, you know, conditional gradient methods avoid any projection and uh, because, you know, the iterates are simply convex combination of the points in the constraint set. So these are projection-free algorithms. But for our problem, we have to overcome two issues. Uh, first, we do not have access to the exact gradients. And second, in order to avoid one half approximation, we should make sure that we do not start from a station point, uh, uh, right? But so I, I'm, more, I'm mainly going to focus on the first issue because the second one is easy to, to resolve. So uh, the easiest fix or the naive fix uh, would be to just use the stochastic gradient, you know, the green vector that I'm showing, uh, in the picture, instead of the exact gradient, uh, you know, the, the red vector that we don't have access to. And unfortunately, this naive fix will not work due to what is called the non-vanishing variance. And uh, one can show that this may lead to arbitrarily bad solutions. Uh, pictorially, you see that, you know, with a small amount of noise, the direction of VT can completely change from one corner to another corner. And the technical reason is that the argmax and expectation oper you know, operators do not commute. And as a result, we don't obtain good uh, estimates of the vector vt. So the correct way to address this problem is through what is called variance reduction. And in particular, let me explain a momentum technique that we developed, which finds accurate estimates of the gradient gradually as the number of iterates grow. So consider a vector dt that I'm showing here, which is um, you know, updated as follows. dt is simply a convex combination of dt minus one from the previous iteration and the stochastic gradient at the current iteration gt. And to gain some intuition, let's see how you know, dt is constructed geometrically. Uh, consider you know, the, the optimization trajectory of an algorithm. These are you know, the iterates x0, x1, all the way to, you know, through xt. And at each iterate, uh, xc, there is a gradient vector. These are the red vectors in the figure. And of course, we don't have access to, uh, you know, to the exact gradients. Instead, we can obtain an unbiased estimate of the gradients. These are the green vectors, gt, uh, that I'm showing in the figure. Now, the vector dt, our momentum estimator, is simply a weighted combination of all these green vectors. And the weights will be designed in a way that more load is given to iterates closer to t and less weight to iterates far from t. So here are the properties of our you know, momentum estimator. The vector dt is a bias estimator, which is not a very good thing. It is uh, you know, very efficient to compute. At each iteration, we just need to obtain one stochastic sample of the gradient and then do a sample, a simple vector update and you know, we can show that the noise of the gradient estimation vanishes as a result of this weighted sum. In particular, if we set the, the weight parameter to roughly one over t, t to the two thirds, then the gradient and the vector dt converge at a sublinear rate. So given this result, we can propose this stochastic continuous greedy algorithm. And we can see this as the greedy algorithm in the continuous domain. So basically, we start from the origin because we can show that this is never a stationary point. And at each iteration, we form, uh, you know, we, we form the vector dt, find the ascent direction dt by solving a linear program, and then use a constant step size of one over capital T to go to the next um, iterate. So we can show that SCG, a stochastic uh, uh, continuous greedy, achieves the tight one minus one over the approximation guarantee with the sublinear rate of one over epsilon cube. And the main reason that we can suddenly avoid the stationary points is related to the, the, to the trajectory of the optimization. In fact, we can show that at each 
iteration t, a point is identified that in expectation reduces the gap to the optimal solution by a significant amount, basically one over capital T fraction, plus some error terms that are shown in red. The error terms you know, result in convergence rate and the you know, one over T fraction uh, leads to the correct approximation guarantee. Now, you know, uh, remember one minus one over T raised to the power T is basically one over E. That is the reason that you get uh, the correct approximation guarantee. So, so far, this is a landscape. You know, we can achieve the tight approximation guarantee with, with the one over epsilon cube convergence rate and the sublinear uh, one over half uh, and the su suboptimal one over half approximation guarantee with the faster rate of one over epsilon squared. And in fact, we can show that in order to achieve the tight approximation guarantee of one minus one over E, the rate should be at least one over epsilon squared. So in summary, both uh, algorithms are computation simple. They only need one uh, stochastic gradient. One is fast, the other one is tight. But to achieve the fast rate with the tight approximation guarantee, we need one more idea. So the momentum estimator tried to estimate the gradient directly. However, we can obviously write the gradient at, you know, at time t as a telescopic sum, right? And the advantage of writing the gradient in this form is that once the function is smooth, the difference of gradients are small, and we can easily estimate them with high accuracy. And here is one way to do it. By the fundamental theorem of calculus, the difference between the gradients at two positions can be written as the integral of the Hessian times the difference of positions. But what is this integral? This is nothing but an expectation where a random variable A is sampled uniformly at random from the interval zero one. So an unbiased estimate of the difference of gradients can be obtained by multiplying the stochastic Hessian and the vector xs minus xs minus one. And if we want to reduce the noise of this estimator, we can you know, sample multiple A's and you know, denote the empirical mean of the Hessian vector product by delta B at position S. So this way, we get a similar looping recursion that results in variance reduction. As we are adding noisy observations, similar to the law of large numbers, the variance is shrinking. Uh, so the new estimator is unbiased, which is a pretty good thing, but requires a batch of size B. The algorithm is very similar to SCG, the one that we just saw. So we call this one SCG++. And, you know, in fact, you know, this time we are using a better estimator in terms of the variance reduction, which leads to the following theorem that uh, says that once we set the batch size to one over epsilon, this new algorithm achieves the tight approximation guarantee of one minus one over E with the sublinear rate of one over epsilon squared. However, the algorithm is not simple, right? As the batch size has to increase at the rate of one over epsilon. So naturally, we can it, ask- But the, the total sample complexity here is also still cubic in epsilon, right? No, no, you run it one over epsilon. Oh, you run one over epsilon steps, just a very yeah. large batch. Yeah. Oh, okay. So the sample complexity has gotten better. Yeah, it is. it has the tight sample complexity, tight approximation guarantee, but the batch size increases. It's not simple. So naturally, we can ask whether we can have the best of both worlds, meaning an unbiased estimator that does not require an increase in batch size. And this can be achieved as follows. You know, we can easily debias the momentum estimator by adding the difference of gradients to the recursion. That's it. So as I said, this new estimator is unbiased. It is computationally affordable. Uh, you know, as it requires one stochastic gradient at each iteration, it reduces the noise of the gradient approx approximation at the correct rate of one, of one over t. And as a result, we, you know, we, we will have an algorithm that we call one sample stochastic Frank Wolf, which among many interesting properties is parameter free, meaning that you know, we do not need to tune the batch sizes, step sizes, learning rate, and many other hyperparameters. And in fact, it achieves the tight approximation guarantee of one minus one over E with the correct sublinear rate of one over epsilon squared. And in summary, you know, one sample of stochastic Frank Wolf achieves the best of all words. It is fast, it is simple, and it is tight. So with all these results, we obtain a quite complete picture of the landscape. The stochastic gradient ascent is fast, but achieves a suboptimal approximation guarantee. 
stochastic continuous greedy achieves a tight approximation guarantee, but it is not fast. One sample of stochastic Frank Wolf is fast and achieves a tight approximation guarantee. And you know, our results are much more general. You know, for convex optimization problems, we achieve the epsilon uh, approximate optimum with the tight uh, rate of one over epsilon squared. Um, for general, uh, you know, continuous homotopy functions, not necessarily monotone, we achieve the one over e approximation guarantee with the with the same convergence rate. And for non-convex functions, we achieve the epsilon first order session points with the tight rate of one over epsilon q. Okay. Question: uh, The half approximation factor up. is that Sorry. fundamental? You you are breaking up. I couldn't. Can you hear me okay now? Yes. The half approximation factor is that uh, fundamental? It was. Uh, it is not fundamental, right? So we achieve one minus one over e, which is better. Um, yeah, but for the same. Uh, let's, say, let's say if I wanted 0.9, can you get similar? Achievability results. You cannot. Oh, sorry. Good. So you cannot go above one minus one over e in in polynomial time. So you cannot get to zero point nine. The the tightest, you. you know, the best approximation guarantee that you can get is one minus one over e that we achieve with the fastest rate. It's impossible to go above. Thanks. In general, right? So uh, for this class of problems, yeah. Okay. Um, how do you set the rho t, the discount factor? Uh, one over t for the uh, uh, for okay. this new estimate. Yeah. So okay. you have to lower it. Yes, because you have a better estimator, you lower it, and then it becomes unbiased and everything. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, no. Uh, so remember, the goal was to solve the discrete problem, right? So let's go back to John's problem uh, question. Um, uh, and uh, so now let's go back to our stochastic district optimization problem. And the way that we are going to solve this problem is by properly extending the set function to the continuous domain so that we can use the methods we have developed so far, okay? And for this, we are going to rely on the multilinear extension defined as follows. For any vector x inside the unit cube, the value of the multilinear extension equals to the expected value of, a, of the set function over random sets, right? Where each element in this random set is included independently with probability xe. So in this view, each set is identified by a binary vector that corresponds to the corner of the unit cube, where the value of the continuous multilinear extension is exactly the value of the underlying set function on the corresponding set. So the multilinear extension has um, you know, several um, important properties. It is a smooth, differentiable, and most, important, most importantly, if we set the function, if, if, if the set function uh, f is, is submodular, its multilinear extension is dr submodular, okay? However, it is hard to evaluate it exactly because we need to go over all possible subsets. And for the same reason, hard to differentiate it exactly. Now, the key bridge is that the optimum solution for both stochastic discrete and continuous multilinear extension are equal when the set function is submodular. Okay, and now the question is how to solve the continuous uh, you know, problem when we only have access to the discrete stochastic problem for where for any set S, it returns a realization F theta of S. Uh, so note that for the continuous problem, we need the uh, access to a, to, uh, to a continuous stochastic oracle that provides an unbiased estimate of the gradient for any vector x, right? And it turns out that this is easy to do. In fact, an unbiased estimate of the ith coordinate of the gradient can be formed by this difference that I'm showing on the top. So, so we can read the entries of the unbiased stochastic gradients from the output of the discrete stochastic oracle. And given this observation, we can run our continuous greedy algorithm, right? Like the one uh, sample of stochastic Frank will to, to find a continuous solution that is one minus one over E approximation to the optimum. Now 
we need to round it to integral values as we need a discrete solution. And this can be easily done using one of the standard techniques such as contention resolution, randomized pipe page rounding, et cetera. So note that you know, we found a discrete solution A with the tightest approximation guarantee without knowing uh, you know, the underlying stochasticity, without being able to compute exactly the non-convex relaxation or without being able to find the optimum point of the continuous relaxation uh, that is usually the goal in linear and convex programs. So instead, this lifting a strategy relies on three ingredients, the structured non-convex relaxation, uh, efficient stochastic continuous optimization, and lossless rounding. So as a result, it provides a new framework to understand combinatorial optimization and bring them one step closer to a technology. Now let's see the big picture here. And let's again look at you know, the parallel between discrete and continuous optimization, in particular when the objective, uh, objectives are submodular or convex. Traditionally, we use the greedy algorithm to maximize the submodular function, similar to using a you know, gradient descent to minimize the convex function. With the emergence of modern challenges, such as you know, stochastic, online, or decentralized models of computations, the continuous optimization community developed new gradient methods uh, to overcome such challenges, right? Uh, the same way for some modular optimization, we are currently developing new greedy algorithms by you know, building a bridge between discrete and structured non-convex optimization so that uh, you know, uh, uh, robust, uh, so that you know, uh, uh, we, we can obtain robust uh, solution against all sorts of uncertainty. So, now let me talk uh, you know, for a few minutes about some uh, interesting future directions. Um, as I said earlier, this new framework allowed us to start you know, resolving some of the challenging problems in some modular optimization. For, you know, for example, in online learning, which is an instance of a repeated two-player game, we provided the first online submodular optimization methods with low regret through our lifting framework. Similarly, in decentralized setting where the data is distributed over a network of connected computing units, we provided the first consensus methods for some modular maximization. And crucially, instead of you know, sending and receiving discrete values, the nodes communicate beliefs that rely on continuous extension. They can compute on their own. And finally, we showed in distributed optimization when the communication is the main bottleneck, we can use continuous methods to, com you know, to compress and quantify uh, information and trade off communication and, uh, and accuracy. So I believe this is a framework that will allow us to robustify uh, combinatorial optimization in many other various settings. And um, you know, it will be at the core of the next generation of algorithms. Another important direction that I'm very excited about is how we can go beyond submodularity. For instance, in model interpretation, we would like to, uh, you know, to know which subset of data points or which subset of features lead to a particular prediction. This is a combinatorial optimization problem in nature. Usually the objective functions are not submodular, but one can try to provide guarantees based on their distance to a submodular function. And again, I believe that the right algorithms that are robust against you know, the unknown distance to submodularity are based on our lifting framework. Uh, another very uh, uh, important generalization is in the sequential um, uh, information gathering, such as you know, our touch-based robotics application uh, that I'm showing here, where through interactions with the environment, we would like to maximize an unknown utility function. Again, in such settings, we're still in search of robust policies that best reduce uncertainty against noisy and persistent observations. And what makes such problems very challenging is that when the, you know, the noise is present, we no longer enjoy diminishing returns conditions. And we're currently working on you know, continuous methods that uh, may lead to provable robust policies. And finally, uh, sampling and optimization are simply two facets of the same coin. And there is a you know, natural interplay between the two fields. And I believe there is a revolution happening right now in sampling from both discrete and continuous methods by either using you know, diffusion, uh, you know, score-based diffusion or spectral independence. And I'm sure that we'll see many deep connections between combinatorial optimization and sampling in the next few years. One fascinating direction um, uh, to me is the use of continuous methods for better and faster discrete sampling. 
Okay, so uh, in, for the last few minutes, let me uh, you know talk about you know some of the uh, applications um, that, in my opinion, you know one of the most important areas where AI can positively affect the society is in the medical domains, for which we desperately need interpretable methods. This is where you know uh, combinatorial techniques uh, particularly shine, as they usually and automatically provide interpretable results. So let me uh, uh, give a few examples of my own work in the last few years. Uh, so in collaboration with the School of Public Health at Yale, we developed a robust statistical method to estimate the size and infer the connections between the member of a hard to reach population, such as drug users in New Haven and Hartford areas. The main challenge in such problems is that we cannot rely on randomized sampling. People usually refrain from answering questions regarding their drug use. Instead, health organizations such as NIH routinely use a different survey method, uh, which is called respondent-driven sampling that relies on monetary incentives for which very little statistical properties are known uh, as you know, the samples are highly biased. And we, we showed that you know, many natural diffusion processes on social graphs lead to submodular probabilistic models. And because of that, the map configuration or using variation inference for sampling is a tractable process. Another example is you know, the app that we developed for COVID outbreak detection in collaboration with the, you know, with the uh, medical school at Yale. And the app uh, aims to infer the social ties and estimate the spread of COVID with neighboring noise based on you know, some major uh, uh, coverage functions. And finally, and maybe the most interesting project, which um, I'm currently collaborating with the Department of Neuroscience in med school is on understanding of human brain using neuroimaging techniques. Uh, so let me uh, explain this project a little bit more. And as uh, uh, this recent and very interesting article from the New Yorker states, uh, you know, it is not so much that brain scans have improved. Uh, it's that we, we got better at reading them. And this is, you know, more than ever an algorithmic problem. For instance, in our work, we, uh, we um, tried to, to develop an efficient, robust method to generate personalized and flexible brain maps. So how do we construct such brain maps? Well, we look at brain images that we get from fMRI machines and try to understand what brain regions talk to each other and how this conversation changes as we engage in different tasks, uh, you know, such as playing a game or watching a movie. And we summarize brain activity of millions of voxels down into a few hundred reliable representative points. Uh, so here, a voxel, if you don't know, a voxel is a 3D um, building block of brain image, which consists of hundreds of thousands of neurons analogous to a pixel in a display. And note that the objective function is precisely of the form that we discussed in this talk, where exact evaluation is not really possible. And we have to be careful. Then we automatically, automatically translate those representative points into brain maps and construct personalized and flexible brain maps. So once such reliable representation are found, we can exploit predictive models to reverse engineer the brain. So we applied our method, a combination of submodular representation learning and automated boosting to brain images of more than 700 individuals and constructed their brain maps. So to our surprise, we observed that you know, these brain maps are unique to each individual, such that we could, you know, we could uniquely identify people with 99% accuracy just by looking at their brain maps. Uh, so in other words, these brain maps that we develop are like fingerprints. Not only that, we could also predict the fluid intelligence of individuals. And my student, Merave, who ran the experiments, insisted that this is our relative intelligence. Uh, and uh, we could also predict the individual's uh, biological sex only you know, using their personalized brain maps. We also discovered that these brain maps are not fixed, but they reliably reconfigure by task. And you know, th these reconfigurations are significant enough that could, we could predict what people were doing from a set of eight predefined tasks with you know, very high accuracy, like 97%. Uh, uh, and the task uh, you know, included measures of primary sensory processes, you know, such as vision and motor functions and a broad uh, you know, range of cognitive and, and effective processes such as working memory. So what is next? Well, you know, we are planning to expand our technique to, uh, to real time cognitive inference. And for this to happen, we must uh, make a computational leap from predicting eight tasks in a few minutes to hundreds of thousands of tasks in just a few milliseconds. 
Also currently, you know, our evaluations only include healthy controls. We are planning to apply this approach to clinical populations where such personalized approaches may um, show even greater improvements. And finally, let me, you know, finish this talk with some of my aspirations. Um, you know, these advancements at the intersection of optimization, AI, and neuroscience have the potential to bring us one step closer to personalized medicine. And hopefully soon, you know, you will benefit from personalized diagnostics and treatment that is spe specifically designed for you, your body, and your brain. And if we can overcome all these challenges, uh, you know, I believe, you know, such a brain reading technology could facilitate uh, brain con control prosthetics, seamless human computer interaction, and, you know, the next generation of uh, virtual and augmented reality. So I hope that after this talk, you're also fascinated by the beautiful structure of some major functions. Uh, if so, you know, here are a few resources. I have given a few tutorials at ICML, ICIT, uh, ISIT, and CVPR regarding the algorithms, the theory, and the applications of submodularity. We are also finalizing two monographs on submodularity and condition gradient methods. And there are already two open source Julia packages with the fastest variants of algorithms that, I, that I'm aware of. Thank you very much.